Hi, Professor Steve Allen again here. I hope you enjoyed our performance. Um, if you're still with us, um, I just wanted to share with you some of the fruits of my research on this work because I do think this is a very important piece. Um, Elgar, at the end of his life, pretty much gave up writing music um, after the death of his wife. And the Seventh Suite is almost certainly the most significant piece that he wrote um, after 1920. Uh, George Bernard Shaw, the poet and playwright, who was a huge fan of Elgar's, along with many other people, wanted Elgar to write a third symphony. And although he made sketches of these and he referred to them in his, in his letters, um, he never actually wrote that symphony. Interestingly enough, though, he did write the Seventh Suite and dedicated it to George Bernard Shaw. So a case could be made that this is, um, in some ways, if Elgar's Third Symphony is too strong of a claim, um, some type of a symphony or, or a sonata. Um, I think this is made clear by the fact that in 1922 he'd commissioned Sir Arthur Bliss to write the Colour Symphony for the Three Choirs Festival, and um, Elgar must have thought after hearing that piece uh, that he couldn't write an Elgarian symphony in the way that he had with one and two. Neoclassicism was now the dominant style. In fact, in the year he wrote the Seventh Suite, uh, Stravinsky wrote his Symphony of Psalms. And so to some extent, we might say that in the Seventh Suite, Elgar is toying with the idea of neoclassicism. His nearest partner in crime in this respect is Richard Strauss, who similarly, at this stage in his life, uh, experimented and explored playing around with early classical ideas. So what happens in the Seven Suite? Well, <clears throat> he was commissioned by Whiteley uh, to write this piece at a time when he was playing around with Mozart. He'd written a Mozart symphony as a very young man where he'd written out the same score number of bars that Mozart had used in his Symphony Number no. 40. And Elgar then filled in that exact same number of bars uh, with music of his own, which he claimed to be one of the best lessons uh, that he'd ever learned, because Elgar was completely self-taught um, in these respects. And around the time he was writing The Seven Suite, he was also going back to the music of his childhood. Uh, there's a strong sense of nostalgia in a lot of the music that he was writing around this time. But it would be completely wrong to think that in The Seven Suite, all Elgar did was arrange and borrow music that he'd written earlier, as though just to slough off the, uh, the um, commitment to the piece. Research shows that there's a lot of thematic connection between these materials, and let me just explain what those are very, very briefly. Um, in the fugue that you've just heard, there are two ideas. There's the fugue theme, which when you stack them on top of each other, become a flow of eighth notes or quavers. Da, 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 dee, da, da, da. And this is quite clearly related to the second subject of the introduction, which I associate with Alice Elgar herself. So Alice plays a very strong musical role um, in the piece. Whereas interestingly, the mistletoe theme from the fugue, da, 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 that rhythm of a slow note, two fast notes and a slow note, are related to the very opening music that we hear that is Elgar himself. Da, 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 da. So the fugue basically generates the music of the introduction. And once we pass through the introduction and we get into the Toccata, there are some new musical ideas. Two of them come from a piece that he wrote in 1928 called Beau Brummel. One of them, bum, 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 is kind of serious, almost like somebody wagging their finger at you or, or poking you reprovingly in the ribs. Um, the other idea, da 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 is just throwaway, flippant, li like a dandy. Bo Brummel, of course, was a London uh, dandy, and Elgar himself was in always impeccably well-dressed as an English uh, countryman, so there's a little bit of autobiography here. Then there are some new musical ideas, da 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 this little canon idea that we hear that's new music from 1930. And Elgar, who was an inveterate card player, takes these pieces of music, I call them ditzy, da 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 emphatic, bum bum, bum 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 bum, and cadential canon, da 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 And he rotates these round and round until we suddenly get this other theme, this grandioso theme. Um, ba ba bum bum ba da da ba bum ba bum, which is very much out of the middle period Elgar, full star, full blooded, if you like. And in this way, he builds this, this very complex picture in the Toccata of music that is related in some way to his introduction and allegro, 
also to some extent to his first symphony, the rapid music um, in his first symphony. But this is all, mu all new music from 1930. Um, and of course, bum 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 is an inversion of ba rum bum bum ba dum. So this little semitonal idea that we also find related to the minuet da di da 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 is one thematic idea that connects them. And also we get the same rhythm that we hear in the fugue ba da da di da 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 in emphatic in the toccata bum 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 and also in the minuet theme da 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 di da 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 so the three inner movements are all bonded together by these thematic um, and rhythmic ideas the other kind of quaint thing about the minuet um, is that the two ideas were taken from um, two wind quintet pieces that Elgar wrote for a quintet called the Brothers Wind uh, because his brother played in it Elgar himself played uh, bassoon um, and they call this music shed music. It's kind of a quaint English thing. And he takes these two ideas, the first minuet idea, which is taken from Harmony Music Number no. 5, which is a kind of symphony, actually. It's like a Mozart symphony, that piece. Uh, so again, we get this symphonic idea, uh, combined with this chirpy little thing that he takes from Promenade Number no. 5 that he wrote in London, that may very well represent um, Elgar as a Londoner. Uh, so we get those two ideas uh, in, interspersed with each other, with these little peeps that I mentioned in the introduction that are then related to the three uh, bass drum rolls at the end. And then with the introduction coming back as the coda, um, very significantly we get these flashback ideas. Um, and then finally, as I say in the introduction, we get the kind of the cry on the soprano chord, the groan in the full band, and then the two heartbeats uh, that take us out. The last thing I want to say about the, the piece is that it's in arch form. In other words, the introduction and the coda are related to each other like an arch. Then the toccata and the minuet are related to each other as a kind of an arch. And then the central movement, the fugue, is the heart of the piece. Elgar may have been familiar with Bella Bartok's string quartets, which embody arch form. It's also interesting that Benjamin Britten, six years later, would write a symphonic song cycle, Our Hunting Fathers, that also has five movements that are built in an arch form in this kind of way. So again, we get this evidence that Elgar is exploring these symphonic ideas. And the fact that after this, uh, the seventh suite goes on to become the basis of his second organ sonata, um, in B flat is significant and the fact that Elgar then goes on to orchestrate it for full orchestra shows that this piece was far more than just a passing flippant response to a brass band commission. It's a very very significant piece and I think it does lay claim to being arguably Elgar's third symphony in some kind of form or at least a sonata concept which is very very significant. So I'm hoping that these comments uh, the scholarship, I've written an article for the Musical Times uh, that if you want to track it down goes into these matters in a lot more depth. But we're trying to make a case here that this piece that has been somewhat patronised, somewhat ignored, somewhat relegated to the sidelines of Elgar should now be brought into the centre. It's very, very significant, certainly the most significant piece in his final period. And we're hoping that this will lead to many more performances uh, and recordings that we can all enjoy. Again, thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it.